I want to tell you a story about what some friends and I got up to a few years ago. You've let yourself in for tales of sled dogs with a dislike for running, months of polar darkness, unhelpful teammates, a skiing Danish man without skis, and by far and away the most special time I've spent in the Arctic, having had thousands of days on expeditionary journeys to choose from. Part of the reason is that things didn't end up at all as we planned it, but you'll see why and how. I think the best place to start is as we touch down in Greenland, and with the assumption that you're all bona fide experts on the rough geography of the Arctic, and Greenland in particular. My team of four were headed right up to the far north, but had to catch a series of flights in aeroplanes of decreasing size up the coast. In each settlement between the six legs, we only spent from a few hours to an overnight, but tried to make use of the time by recording a few thoughts. Also, making some purchases, having teammate James catch up with the team in having his hair cut short for practicality, and getting used to the dark. We were travelling in winter, where the Arctic really shows you the meaning of perpetual darkness. Our staging post for a journey onto the Arctic Ocean was the Greenlandic Inuit settlement of Kanak. It's the largest in the far north and home to a little over 500 people. The community and culture is distinct from those in western or eastern Greenland, and the small Inuit population in the extreme northwest are known locally as Inui, whose spelling and meaning is subtly different. They were the last community to make contact with Europeans in the year 1818. Such visitors from abroad have long since used other terms like Arctic Highlanders or Polar Eskimos to set them apart. The latter name can generate significant offence if used in Arctic Canada and increasingly in the south of Greenland, an unsurprising colonial legacy. In the far north though, and in parts of Alaska, it's markedly more relaxed. We were due to head out of Kanak on skis soon after, and so needed to unload hundreds of kilos of pre-shipped freight, make sense of what of the last minute supply of clothing we needed and what we didn't, and re-familiarise with specialist gear like these polar bear trip wire posts. The bottom there's an ice screw fixed in, absolutely solidly fixed in. It also gave us a few hours to run through our safety planning and ensure everyone was comfortable using our final lines of defence. Anders also kept himself busy educating us in Danish about stretching samples of frozen material that he promised to test for a sponsor. Let's stop. This was to be our main mode of travel boots or skis directly on the ice, and all supplies hauled in a sledge, as has been my preference since starting out in polar travel. It's perhaps the purest and most adaptable, albeit the slowest, way of getting around in the cold. <laughs> Another one bites the dust. Sorry, I am filming. <laughs> it wasn't to be just us four though, our living, breathing and barking warning system to make us aware of approaching polar bears en route was to be Dave. I'd bought him from a local hunter the year before, intentionally as a lazy but amiable dog. Initially he was a little overwhelmed as we turned up en masse, but time and food would solve that. That is, the food that his pups weren't hoovering up at great speed. Dave had been positioned outside the home of his previous owner, as I'd asked for him to be given extra human contact and to be fattened up. The majority of adult male dogs in settlements are staked away from most homes, largely due to the noise. In the dark, of course, everything that the Arctic makes difficult gets yet trickier, and if you ask me, more rewarding. But our multi-month journey wasn't to be. High winds along our route hundreds of miles north fractured the sea ice, blocking our way. After hours of exploring contingency options, we realised it would be foolhardy to launch. Dejected as we were, the four of us looked for an alternative, and that alternative would set our course for the next near six months. We'd stay in the region and try something altogether different. And from this decision to not return home feeling sorry for ourselves comes our story. We'd learned from scratch how to drive dog teams, which is the overwhelming method of travel in Greenland's north. These years later, I did ask James and Anders how they felt about this enormous change of plan and I think it's fair to say that James was least keen on the change to dog sleds at the time. 
uh, not that I felt kind of, you know, uh, railroaded or anything in that sense, but that, that wasn't what we were going to be ending up doing. Um, and then there was the, the recommittal, the refocus. The transition from ski journey to a slip dog was really, really easy for me. What we'd do once at least half competent was anyone's guess. Who knows if we'd even be welcome to stay, let alone buy 20 dogs, which is how many we'd estimate would be enough for two teams. Having put word out though, we soon found ourselves in charge of 20 hungry mouths to feed. They weren't what you'd call docile or quiet, and we didn't know if they were any good. Um, should I do the thing with the harness? Uh, yeah, I think we should do that after Jason though. Okay, sure. I'm trying to keep uh, them nice and calm. Before really setting to work though, we needed to get some sledge hauling out of our systems. So we hauled out into the darkness with a dog each for company and protection. Hello Odin. Good morning James. Good morning. Morning Anders. Good morning. It was about 40 miles to a tiny village called Kekatat, home to barely two dozen people, taking us two days on the way there and one long slog on the way back. How's it going, James? Well, it looks a bit like Scotland. <laughs> um, it's nothing like Scotland. <laughs> it's midday, so we're having a little snack. Kind but puzzled locals let us sleep and rest in their communal building. That is one happy dog. I won't lie, aside from having some broad experiences with dogs in the past and my own canine behaviour studies from university, we didn't have a clue what we were doing, and it showed. You can't just turn up at the local dog driving school, so we just got on with it and learned everything from basic handling, mostly the hard way. Look what we're doing. Uh, we're starting off uh, with dogs attached to sledges for the first time. And these are our three chosen uh, lucky dogs. Uh, it's Odin, uh, BS and Sierra uh, Plant Dog, who has yet to have a name. And uh, we're just putting their traces on, uh, taking their chains off. And we'll take them down to these sledges, which are going to go the top. Before really settling into a dog training regimen, however, we had a few housekeeping jobs to complete, having been given access to a small wooden home on the edge of the village. We needed water, and knew that aside from the short summer when glacial runoff could be used, the only source was from icebergs offshore. We hadn't yet worked out how to ask for the centrally collected and melted ice yet, something of a community public service, so headed out to hack some chunks off. Having enjoyed thwacking a large lump of ice with an unhelpfully small axe, we returned with sufficient iceberg ice to manage a few cups of hot tea. It turned out that we had some other canine visitors from around the village. It's fairly normal for females with pups to roam around loose, and pups themselves have free reign until about six months of age. We had our own dogs now, but before we could even think about going anywhere, we obviously needed sleds for them to run in front of. This was not straightforward. You don't merely go to a shop and choose the correct model of sled. You make your own, if you know how. And despite being very hands-on and practical, the team and I did not. So we enlisted the help of Rasmus, who I knew from selling me Dave the year before, and a couple of his friends. Language was a challenge. We didn't speak Inuktun, the token name given to the local dialect, even though I've never heard locals use the word. They didn't speak English beyond a few words. We'd not yet met the two or three villagers who had mastered it, but in any case, why would they? Danish was a passable bridging language, but even that wasn't an easy solution, as not all locals spoke it, and on our side only Anders was fluent. You're going to notice that in this film, footage of the local people is fleeting at times. We didn't want to stick cameras in their faces all the time. We were there to live and to learn, not to be Louis Theroux, and anything recorded was something of a bonus. It would be easy to ruin any chance of becoming oddball parts of the community and instead end up untrusted and isolated. Pointing and watching went a long way, and before long we were not making a complete hash of it. Design, angles and special knots had to be spot on. 
you do not just nail together planks in roughly the right shape. The lashing takes almost all the load and means the sled can flex under impact. Anastasia, our Russian component, due to our plan change, would need to spend the middle bulk of our long stay back in Europe so that visa stipulations weren't breached. It was a blow, as she brought a key dimension to the team. In spite of this, she got stuck in with the prep work as we managed to get her a space on the weekly flight, which is frequently cancelled due to weather. Some precious power tools sped things up a great deal, before a minor diplomatic incident led to a period of more traditional methods. Soon though, powered back up we were. The finishing touches soon began to take shape, like splicing the main hauling rope and fixing in the final cross beams. I also applied lots of oil to the wood, which helps it stop splitting in the incredibly dry arctic air. Anyway, we had two enormous sleds, and dogs that at least in theory might pull them along. Short walks up and down the beach to fetch meat and fish offered up a few tips, but it soon dawned on the four of us that the learning curve would be steep. If we messed up, both dogs and we could end up injured, or worse. We had no hunting credentials on our own, so we're relieved to find that excess catches from the experts, the ones that had made the sparsely populated corner of the Arctic famous, were on sale to lesser mortals like us. At first the dogs were based on a steep hill that led directly from the frozen beach. This was fine as it meant a short walk each day down from our abode to check on what chaos they'd caused, to feed them and to do basic care for their paws and so on. However, it was just far enough away to not completely deafen our neighbours. People did keep a few dogs in the middle of the village, and I'm not sure how many neighbourly disputes this causes. Around our home we only staked out Dave, Yeah, but he's the best looking dog. Laika, our female, and Phoenix, a skinny dog that needed more intense feeding. Even in the early, darkest days when we only dared to take out half a team, or one full team between us all, everything was a faff. None of our hundreds of days of Arctic time counted for much, and each new skill needed learning, messing up, and then learning again properly. One positive was that the dogs, having begun to associate our arrival in our silly yellow jackets with either food, exercise, or a little affection, did seem to like following us around. Dave was an exception, of course, on the exercise front. We'd bought him for his laziness qualities, and so were stuck with the old softy. Dave also had formed alliances amongst his team in his commitment to not doing anything, but more about them in a moment. Right now we are trying to get the dogs to run in a straight line without us running in front. And uh, we just had a little bit of success, a couple of minutes of a straight run. Uh, but then the little flight uh, started, so we're trying again. Let's see if we can go forward without uh, us running in front. Getting across the jumbled up tidal sea ice that lined the edge of the beach was becoming a slight hassle. Even with shipping pallets used to weigh down the sleds and thereby slowing them down to a manageable pace, we were getting rather tired of the daily spine-jarring rubble ice crossings. The plan was to later bring all the dogs and a crate for meat and fish down onto the sea ice itself and set up an HQ of sorts. Making and improving our custom chain and rope staking system kept us busy in the evenings, as did repairing harnesses that Dave kept on insisting on chewing through. It was around Christmas time, a festival rather oddly imported into Inuit communities, and so we thought that we'd give the dogs a good feed and a day off. And uh, I'm not going to make them wait any longer because they're quite keen for it. These are what we call the hitmen. This is uh, Leon and Jason, and they're going to probably quite enjoy this, I think. It was also a day that galvanised my policy ever since that dogs aren't supposed to wear hats. I'm not sure Dave really likes his Santa hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh Dave <laughs> Especially dogs that appear to enjoy eating anything not made of metal Soon though, we had somewhere to aim for Fishing is a key occupation year round and the continuous darkness isn't allowed to impact on it Techniques of course differ from winter to summer as dog teams have been shown to perform poorly on open water the community does have an annual resupply of tinned and packeted goods, sold at a shop, but local meat and fish sustain the community and their dogs. Uh, we're about to see uh, Michael, who, uh, who is out fishing. So we went out a couple of kilometers uh, east of the village, um, out to all the fishing huts where all the locals fish uh, halibut. 
We found Michael, who you saw maintaining his sled in the workshop earlier, about a mile offshore in a wooden hut that could be pulled along by dogs. He shared it with another hunter. Once a few dozen baited hooks were dropped on a long weighted line under the ice into the current, into the heated hut we went. We'd cause more chaos than offer assistance by interfering in his fishing setup, but we watched carefully as the tips and tricks were too many to count. It wasn't a stellar catch, but remarkable to a novice nonetheless. The best halibut are either eaten or sold, and the smaller ones and the bycatch could go straight to Michael's dogs. During the visit, I had suggested that we risk leaving our dog team as it was, a few yards away in the dark, for the few hours spent at the fishing spot. The hassle of staking them out in ones and twos is a pain. Hello, trouble. Luckily, they and our sled were still there, having relied on a single ice screw and their collective lack of ambition. Training continued hard through January. Total failure in the early days was followed by something approaching coherent forward motion. Odin's really caught. James, are you happy? Deliriously! Should we try another iceberg? That is further out? Yeah. So I don't have anything to hit? What can we see? As the month continued, a gentle twilight had grown on the horizon through the middle of the day, but we were still a month away from the end of the winter and the return of the sun. Anders is at the whip and uh, driving us along, doing very, very well. Regardless, being able to see further than the reach of our head torches was naturally welcome. One of our teams had decided to conveniently forget their left and their right. In hindsight, it seems something approaching uncalled for, as icebergs had never really been anything of a menace for us, let alone a nemesis in need of retribution. But this one was about the right distance away, so it was perfect for target practice. So Alex, what are you aiming at? I'm aiming for the little bit on top of the iceberg. Okay, okay. <laughs> sounds great. I got it! Hey! <laughs> Yep. I mentioned before that Dave's low input philosophy as a sled dog wasn't unique to him. McMuffin, probably four or five years old and with a fine coat of fur, was convinced that running with the team wasn't for him. He tried to communicate this to us for some time. I understand it might seem like tough love on our part, but he needed to get over this mental block or else no one would take him on after we left. I wondered about whether his paws were boiling up with ice or were otherwise sore, but it turned out to be a dislike for our alpha dog named Thor. Put him on here. Come, come on, McMuffin. You need to keep going. Maybe he's hurt? He took a little bit of a, uh, a cut on one of his legs with a fight with Thor earlier. That's Thor there just coming into focus. But uh, yeah, so his cuts seem okay, so we're carrying on. He does need to keep going forwards though. Come on, Brook Muffin, you can do it. Off you go. And he's, well, he, he's running at least. Thor never really went for him as far as we could see, but Muffin adopted a firm identity of victimhood unless Thor was on the far opposite side of the team. No need for that, McMuffin. Muffin, stop being such a big grump. Grump, 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 grump. Thor has been uh, pulling uh, the puppy a little bit, so I'm just comforting him. He's a little bit sad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. No bullying. We don't accept that on the team. It's a no tolerance. Ah, yeah. It's like Scotland, isn't it, James? It does look a lot like Scotland. <laughs> right, so we're going to Sierra Palo. Our first multi-day journey was still fully in the darkest of winter and took us up to the most northerly village in the world, Sierra Paluk. It was there our fears of being kept at arm's length at the smaller communities were dispelled for good. 
a hunter whose Danish name, it's normal to have a local name and a Danish name, was Peter, had befriended us in Karnak, and his warmth and generosity meant we grew close to him and his family. We spent hours with various villagers through our training days, some merely curious and others like Peter explicitly keen to help us immerse. Surprised, we found Peter in Sirapaluk too, and the next day he invited us to travel with him. We each spent some time with him on his sled and pulled along by a young dog team he had been training up. His ease, dog control and sheer pace compared to our attempts to keep up kept any delusions of grandeur regarding our improvement firmly in check. Luckily, there were rest stops and we met another dog team on the ice. Ouch, 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 ouch. The video is not actually a picture, but um, yeah, we're on film, but... <laughs> No opportunity for a social gathering is wasted in this otherwise severe part of the world. So we're now on our way back from Sierra Pollock. Um, we managed to get there in the end uh, yesterday. They're about half ten and we're greeted by uh, one of the Peters from Karnak uh, who gave us one of our best dogs and we're currently following him, he's somewhere in the distance, uh, back to Karnak. Um, he's driving a racing sled. <laughs> he is driving a racing sled. Anders is currently trying to slow him down um, <laughs> by being very heavy and getting him his fat self off our sled. Um, but it's not really working. Um, I think the hare's going to win instead of the tortoise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. Once back in our adopted home, the move to getting the dogs, our sleds and supplies down to our designated headquarters didn't come a moment too soon, as I was getting bored of this. James, we said no bumping about! <laughs> Have some cool dogs. You know, you sort of whip from side to side, and the dogs are in a little line behind you, um, like you're crossing the road with a you know group of unruly kids, and um, and they really want to get past you, but you've got to kind of maintain this calm and make it clear to them that they're definitely not going to get past you. Um, Anyway, I, I just remember screwing that up and them running past me and um, me having to jump on the back and I was going very, very bumpily over that rubble ice and then out into the flatter ice beyond. I had no control over what they were doing and they did a big loop and came straight back over the rubble ice even faster than they'd done before. We like it, uh, no bumps and we like very good control. We had the added issue of one of our dogs named OJ going runabout for a few days and it took us a while to get him back. Some of what will follow might sit awkwardly with some of you, especially those who think that meat should only be presented shrink-wrapped in plastic. So here's the gory footage warning. And for me, someone who takes no pleasure in nature's redness in tooth and claw, it took some getting used to. But our dogs needed at least a kilo of food each per day. Sometimes we needed to supplement with arctic grade working dog dry food, but fish and meat formed the bulk. Separating skin, fat, meat and innards took time, especially when the carcass was only part thawed. At least we had a lino area we could bleach and disinfect afterwards. We didn't have a butchery hook, usually in a cool but inside area of people's homes. Peter showed us at breakneck speed how it was done. The real skill is to ensure that you separate out the furry skin, which is very good for the dog's teeth, away from the fat and then the meat, and then obviously the itters drop out into a bucket below. Yeah, winter ball musky, water. Yeah. Yeah. Is it something I take an avert pleasure in? No, but it needs to happen in this part of the world. In the Arctic, frankly, either you get used to this or you have to leave. It's simply the way that it works there. Feed the dogs. 
And look at our buckets of goodies, all bloody and uh, smelly, just the way they like it. Zero wastage and able to ensure all the dogs get a bit of everything. Some nicer cuts of meat are kept for humans too. Ninja. So we're off to feed the dogs. So do dogs really, really, really wanting to go right for hours on end and, you know, just having to sh sh shout, you know, left, 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 left in Greenlandic for hours. Some days were an awful lot better than others and it just depended what sort of moods the dogs were in. I was saying as long as they're going somewhere, I can really give a shit. <laughs> Because at the moment they're being complete pains in the asses all day. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. It's hard owning 21 dogs. Work, work, work. I suppose it's reasonable to say both we and the dogs were growing slightly less hopeless with each day, leading to time for frivolity. The dogs behind must have been looking back and wondering why their humans were acting like such infants. What's going on? Uh, we're currently essentially without a driver because you and us decided to push Alex off and he has the whip. He's back there somewhere, which is fine. The dog's doing well. And uh, yeah, we're pretty happy. Feeling strong as a team. Yeah? <laughs> we'll stop it a bit there because we're not driving back now. <laughs> Happy days. So uh, I'm, I'm just summoning my feelings of remorse. Um, I'm waiting. Before the sun returned, we looked on with some envy at a sledding race between hunters. There's normally a winter race and a summer race. I can only imagine we weren't invited to this first race because it would be ungallant for our dogs to win by too great a margin. Being hundreds and not thousands of miles from the North Pole, the sun is absent from October until the end of February. Of course, its return changes everything for the people. The light doesn't shine directly on the village until a day or so later, thanks to the mountains on the horizon blocking its path. The next day, though, we enjoyed just 20 minutes of the sun's rays before the orb dipped away once more. I'm not going to try and compete with the levels of noise here, but this is just to give you an idea of what it was like being down at our dog HQ at getting ready time. For us, next came a journey down a long fjord, at the head of which we hoped to find a route onto a wide glacier with a terminus into two lakes. They were excellent for freshwater fishing in the summer, we've been told. After a slight initial breeze, it settled down. The region of the Arctic is well known for having calm weather, and there's good reason as to why it's the only small corner of the north with a lasting native population. Both teams had settled down after a few tweaks into a stable lineup, after swapping a couple of dogs with neighbours. Our foray up the fjord saw some of the best early spring light, but also our coldest temperatures. The maritime weather means you rarely get below minus 40, but we had a few days down into the low minus 30s. There were a cluster of abandoned huts along the way, so we used them for shelter on one of our evenings. Uh, we've just been up one of the fjords around the half island Tule is staying on uh, to find a route up onto the ice cap, but that wasn't possible. It was just a lot of rocks. The ability of the dogs to bed down and get rest was remarkable, whether after a long day in a feed or just grabbing five minutes as their humans discuss the next stage in the plan. In the end we couldn't find a route through, but decided to try again for another glacier later on in the spring. So right now Alex is skiing in front and me and James are on each 
uh, sled and we're trying to catch up with Alex who took off uh, quite a while before us and I'm really enjoying this so I'm having uh, my pie and just relaxing and enjoying the beautiful view Because of Anastasia's forced hiatus from the team, it had meant that James for weeks and weeks on end had worked alone with his team and that had, as well as giving him an awful lot of extra stresses and pressures, I think had given him an awful lot of skills too. I think that moment is so much sweeter for all of the frustrations that we went through beforehand and all of the it not quite working or it being very, very hard work. Meanwhile, the dogs had really found their groove and it was a little bit like just cruising down the motorway. Well, what a nice day, eh? Hopefully this will be a, a quicker return than it was on the way out. Um, it took us far, far too long to get out. The dogs were being, well, they were in an interesting mood. And uh, now they're in, uh, well, they seem to be in a running mood, which is, which is fantastic. And um, yeah, so we're, we're plodding on our way back. Um, Anders is going for a run at the moment having a lovely time. Back at our home, we'd come across a small pup, abandoned as far as we were aware. She was curled up next to Dave for warmth. It was a lucky choice, as other dogs may not have been so hospitable. So it looks like we have 21 dogs now. And milk's going all the way down my front. <laughs> <laughs> we brought her inside and tried to get her to feed. After limited success, she made a mess. So James was volunteered to sort that out. She's doing very well. <laughs> um, we probably shouldn't have called her uh, Goliath, should we? Yeah. But she's messy. pretty massive. Um, she's doing very well. She's slightly reluctant. But, uh, she's, she's probably never had a bath before. No. She'll probably never have one again. She doesn't seem too... anti. Uh, apart from those sort of enthusiastic climbing out of the bath. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> To our relief, and without anything approaching a plan of what to do with this pup that we named Goliath, a friend named Navarana managed to connect us with someone missing a pup. I'm not sure that's how they carry their young. <laughs> <laughs> Goliath's mother had her village roaming privileges revoked for a reason that we couldn't work out, and when Goliath went wandering off, the mother couldn't retrieve her. So today is a slightly uh, windier one, a little bit colder. Um, we're down at about minus 25 degrees with a good sort of 15 uh, mile an hour wind with a little bit of gusting. But uh, it's quite nice and uh, we can see an awfully long way over to Herbert Island behind me. And uh, we're doing our standard uh, interval training today with our dogs. We're getting them to chase after Anders today who's on skis. Meanwhile, we were still out on the ice each day, building up strength in the teams for some more village visits and attempts at longer journeys, perhaps onto glacial ice. Aye. Aye. By and large, the dogs were getting on well. They'd settled into a hierarchy, and each team had a lead dog that listened better than the rest and ran out front on a longer rope. Also, a king dog, or alpha, that kept discipline and dissuaded fidgeting or laziness. If you're wondering about the lines that we're running round the midriffs of our dogs, it's to stop them wriggling backwards out of their harnesses, and that can actually save their lives if they are near a crevasse or near thin ice. Fidgeting caused the ropes to tangle, and detangling dog mess strewn knots was a job coveted by none. On Anders and my team, our lead dog Enrique and king dog Thor both felt their own styles of leadership reign supreme. Dave and the others couldn't care less. Anyhow, this was perhaps inevitable. Say hello, Thor. He's a big bully, but he's quite cute sometimes. No harm was done, but it was a good thing that Enrique ran slightly ahead and not in the team itself. <laughs> we love the dogs, really. <laughs> I just love the fact how consistent they are. They do the same thing every day. It's great. They never misbehave. They always do exactly what we want them to do. They do the same thing. They're shit out and very good on the way home. Hey. 
Ay. ¡Ay! At times, our progress felt like someone was taking with one hand whilst giving with another. Because on one day we would have excellent progress and the dogs seemed to be running well, they also seemed to particularly enjoy the better light levels so they could actually aim for things on the horizon. But then also, all you needed is one or two dogs to either have a disagreement or to simply decide they weren't going to be doing a lot of work that day and all of the work ethic fell apart. That said, when you could tell the dogs were really enjoying their running, there was absolutely no feeling like it. They're all running nicely on snow-free ice and they've got that thing in the distance that they're aiming for so you don't really need to say anything. Uh, they're clearly really happy. Um, you don't need to worry about it. And I have very clear memories of that happening a few times. I guess that's us uh, leaving James behind. <laughs> Anastasia was back. So James, who had done a stellar job running his team solo for so long, had some assistance. We decided to set off once more for Kekatat, the tiny whale hunting settlement we'd walked to back in the midwinter. This time everything would be different. The sun was up for much of the day. <laughs> Our dogs were unrecognisable in comparison to those early, unsure days. We were only having to stop and rest the dogs and detangle the ropes every four or five hours. Initially it felt like every half an hour. Instead of making a beeline straight across the sound, we decided to hug the cliffs instead. Of course, with all the work that the dogs put in, it was important for them to stay hydrated, and so it was our job to make sure that we could find some fresh snow for them. Sometimes the salt from the sea ice below can leach into the snow itself, and so it's important to test to make sure that there's no salt in the snow. When the dogs have a trail to follow, life is good. They love it, and they know where to go. They smell the dogs that last round the route, and they have plenty to stimulate them. But if we went through virgin snow, our pace could drop right down, and so their humans would need to either run and push from behind or ski ahead to offer a target to aim for. I loved this role. A few hours of quiet, reduced odour from the usual position astern of 10 dogs rear ends and the joy of seeing a team of affectionate dogs bearing down on you. We passed landmarks that were invisible through the winter, including headlands and islands named for some of the earliest and most infamously exploitative polar explorers. Crazy. Once in Kekatat, we spent some time with Peter in his small hut. There was time to finish off some seal butchery, play cards, see how many old candle stubs we could set alight as the village lacked electricity, and roll him some cigarettes. No, Tobacco is an unfortunate <laughs> import to the far north, but at least the etiquette of going outside is adhered to. Oh, <laughs> the dogs needed a good feed the next day, which is never a time of peace and tranquility. We were low on seal meat, which had been the staple through the winter weeks, and so along with the suboptimal dry food that was making a dent in our bank balance, I prepped some fish for them. Basically the dogs don't like fish tails because they're spiky, so we cut the fish tails off. The spines need to come off, but otherwise deep frozen fish were devoured in seconds. Kekatat's future seems increasingly secure, which along with Savisovic to the south, I was concerned might not survive the decade. There's a trend for smaller Inuit settlements to empty into the larger ones. So we've been up bright and early this morning and we're just driving our dogs out of Kekatat to the rear and we're going back to kind of like along the same tracks we set yesterday. So far so good, that was running really well and Enrique has proved to be a very good track following dog. So uh, all good. James is a little bit behind with his team and it's looking like it's going to be a slightly overcast but otherwise quite a nice day, no wind at all. I think all of us were finding our relationships with our dogs develop differently. Individual kind of battles and relationships with particular dogs, um, like you need to do this. Um, and obviously we had quite different lead dogs. So Anders, how long has it taken for OJ to be friendly? It has taken around three months. 
to get him to <laughs> uh, where oh. we can pet him without him lying down and shaking. And Mary actually comes up to us and licks our hand. <coughs> and he's very excited in the morning now. He didn't used to be. So that's very good progress. Very happy. And he's a good sled dog as well. So that's good. Poor OJ. OJ had taken absolutely ages to reharness after he decided to make a dash for freedom some days before. And on the whole, it does have to be said that our dogs were quite slow on the old obedience front. Back to glaciers and our final attempt to find a route up. Our new target meant a few days travel to the south, towards the edge of the sea ice and then east. Many glaciers that over the decades have offered easy access to other fjords and shortcuts across outcrops of the ice sheet are now far too steep to navigate with dogs. The villagers have lamented this unrelenting trend of glacial retreat, not to mention the worsening sea ice conditions every single year. Around halfway, we found a summertime hut in a small cove. Generally, it would be used months later from where to hunt isolated herds of caribou and to net migrating birds. For us, though, its positioning offered the best overnight stay of all the seasons we'd spend in the north. Sheltered behind a mountain and with compression waves frozen into the bay, there was even a conveniently located beach long enough to stake out both teams of dogs in a row. Despite the months that had passed, we still needed to supervise feeding time, as in groups of two or three, the dominant dogs would yomp it all up, leaving the meeker short of food and reinforcing their differential in size and confidence. And here we are, ready to go, day two of Find the Glacier. And like has followed us out, so we've had to chain her up because she was causing absolute chaos yesterday. So we'll pick her up on the way back. And uh, the guys are just moving along, along the beach. That was our home for last night, the hut. And here is Crazy being on himself. It was the final day's approach that provided some drama. I'm afraid there wasn't much in the way of footage as we had more pressing matters to attend to. Anastasia and James and their team happened upon some thin ice which had been masked by a little snow. The telltale greyness of dangerous ice wasn't visible. Amazingly, both promptly got out of the water and managed to ensure none of the dogs were lost to the currents under the ice. All dogs, slightly salty and miffed, accounted for and no injuries. Aside from a cold toe, James and Anastasia were okay too. Anastasia held the sledge back while I went forward, so got off the sledge and went to the dogs and tried to get them all to come out on the same side of the hole that they created um, so that they could then run back again. Now, when I got off the sledge and went sideways, I also went through, but thankfully only up to sort of, um, you know, shoulders. So my hands came out and stopped my shoulders and head from going in. And I was able to sort of seal out of the water again very quickly. And thankfully the ice was, you know, it must have been a perfect thickness that, I could go through but with a little bit of spreading myself out and sealing myself out of the ice it, it wasn't breaking instantaneously when I was getting out uh, and looking back that's very lucky so yeah I mean I think a combination of having that really key thought of do we go forwards or backwards that decision was made very very quickly between us right as they just stopped the stage from going backwards we you know decided that together I went and tried to get the dogs forwards um, and then there was the, the thing that I kind of didn't mention was the potential for the dogs not getting out of the water. And if the dogs hadn't gotten out of the water and the sledge had continued to sink in that little moment, there was the, ah, uh, is the sledge going to float? Is it going to pull the dogs down? Because they're very securely attached to the sledge. Um, so we've only got a very limited window here to get the dogs out before the sledge is going to start pulling them down. We made the final approach to the glacier across low undulating land, which in the summer would be a complex network of little freshwater melt streams. The obvious approach led us to a cliff of ice and investigations left and right were frustrating. So basically what you've got here is, um, uh, I'm on top of a load of moraine and uh, that's the glacier as you can see behind me there. And, um, well, there's a lot of this moraine around and it's very very thin snow on top of it it's very difficult to drive dogs over um, and uh, although it's minus 22 degrees at the moment uh, the sun is reasonably strong now actually so um, it's feeling a bit warm when we're skiing uh, we're having to uh, vent a little bit to let the moisture out 
but um, the guys down there at the bottom of the hill are just going to start moving along towards the glacier front and I'll stay and watch up here um, and um, try and help them find a good route. Right now we're trying to get up top of the moraine to see what it's like to the other side. The problem with it though is that we're essentially walking on a load of uh, loose bits of rock like that and the rest of it is basically mud. There's absolutely no rock whatsoever that we're standing on. So it just falls apart like that. That's very sort of chalky and thin. But uh, anyway, we need to find out what's at the top. So Anders is just picking up. It does look very good. There's a big gorge in between the glacier and the moraine. And also, uh, I'm several hundred feet higher, higher up than the rest of the guys with the sleds. So it just looks looks a bit depressing to be honest, but we'll carry on. Eventually, after lots of investigation, dead ends and clambering, we got up over the moraine stack and got ourselves up. The glacier was more or less crevasse free, but we played it safe initially. Time wasn't on our side though, and the victory tour lasted only a few hours before we began our return back via a similar route back to Kanak, and what we knew would be our final few weeks in the far north. Kanak had a springtime games day for the whole community, and seemingly everyone piled out onto the sea ice. Aside from familiar faces, we also came across a side of the community that were perhaps a little more shy, but nonetheless friendly. All locally sourced and hand-stitched together. Some of the kids admittedly lacked an adequate level of respect for their elders, or specifically us, but we got our revenge by directing them away from the prizes during a blindfold game for the younger local children. The second dog sled race came as a conclusion to the day of games. Confoundingly yet again, it wasn't considered appropriate that we compete with our 10 dogs and large transit sleds compared to those veteran experts racing with little two metre sleds and a team of the cream of the crop Thule dogs. Anyhow, we avoided a local upset once more and let the son of one of our friends win. Their style of celebration takes some beating. Dogs that during the race don't make the grade are cut loose and they have to follow along behind their teams. Meanwhile, we'd had a disaster with Thor. Hey, Thor. That king dog of ours we saw earlier. He'd put his leg down a small crack in the ice and broken his leg. He only narrowly avoided a quick dispatch from our rifle, and it's testament to the sheer toughness of this special variety of Arctic dog that without specialist veterinary care, he made a full recovery. Time was against him, as we'd need to rehome our dogs when the ice broke up for the summer. <laughs> to be honest, I almost walked back to the, to the back of the sled and I was going for the rifle because I was pretty sure he was done. Because uh, I saw it as well, and I could see how far down his paw went and he just tumbled over himself. Um, so I was pretty sure it was more or less just cut in half almost. So I was ready to put him down quite fast, just to be sure he wasn't in pain uh, unnecessarily. But then after we got the other dogs off him because they wanted to beat him up because he was screaming. So obviously you get a beating, that's how it is. Um, and you could see that, okay, it was not as bad as I thought it was. Thor's name was quite unsurprisingly because he spent a lot of his time with a low rolling thunder of growling and he was soon back to his old tricks. Yep. Yeah, it was just give him a chance and he actually he became good at the end um, and he was running with us at the end so I'm um, pretty glad I didn't go for the rifle that fast. It was in time for a final visit to Sierra Paluk to explore a route that we'd not seen yet and to say goodbye to friends. Although, it was not to be a restful lap of honour, showing off our accrued, if still rather basic, dog handling skills. The weeks when the polar spring, where sea ice is intact and relatively stable, transitions into the summer, 
obviously evident by the breaking sea ice, do not follow a calendar. They occur when certain factors combine, the long days of sunlight, perhaps a storm or deep swell to destabilise the stationary sea ice pack and no opportunity for new ice to form. We could already see the telltale signs of dodgy ice offshore and the satellite imagery reinforced our gut feeling to play it safe. This meant taking a longer, indirect route, using the fjords and their relative sanctuary from the ice's breakup. Just to give the dogs a bit of an early start, uh, we decided just to do about 25 kilometres along the coast, along to these huts which you can see around behind me now. Luckily, the little hut we used on one of the overnight stops we shared with the father and son team from Sirapuluk, our destination. That evening, they offered advice and tips. The burners were very versatile in that they could be used as both a lamp and a heater, and because the huts were only about 8 foot by 8 foot, it meant that we were able to get it up to temperature very quickly. However, thin ice wouldn't be our key concern, as the next day there was an ominous rumble and hazy sky atop the cliffs. We knew it was coming, so could prepare, but then, a special sort of wind generated by the highlands to the east. Powerful and sudden, it weirdly manifests with blue skies and a slight raising of temperature. This one blew for around a day and a half, so we couldn't get to the settlement in time. There was little in the way of natural shelter, so the dogs had to make do as best as they could. I'm not sure Dave got the hint from the others to hunker down and get out of the worst of it. The wind was so strong it began to move the heavy sleds on its own. Surely enough though, skirting around the final headland and then picking a spot to cross the water that still held enough ice, we managed the final push. Understandably, short of kindly being found somewhere for us to shelter, there wasn't the bustling social gathering we had enjoyed last time in Sierra Puluk. I think we all dreaded the return leg somewhat, not because we feared what state the ice would be in now some days on and after the wind, but mostly because it signalled the end. I mentioned earlier how keeping the dogs hydrated was super important. In fact, dog teams in the past have actually been lost through dehydration if not enough fresh snow can be found. So after this big storm, all of the snow had been moved around and it meant that when we found this large bank of very fresh powder, we let the dogs have a really good eat for a few minutes. We wouldn't manage another multi-day journey with our teams. And so this was the beginning of our goodbye to our dogs. To my relief, we generated significant interest in Karnak for people wanting to take them on. So what we've got here is, um, behind us, a whole load of brand new ice and that was after all the ice broke up a few days ago and it's just starting to reform. It's really, really thin so we can't go over that at all. So what we're doing here, we're just stopping and going to go and climb up onto the ice foot which is attached to the land and see if that gives us any more joy. In the distance behind me you can see uh, Sierra Polo, I suspect, long, long way away now and uh, we're hopefully going to zoom along round this headland and into the next fjord. Jokes about us standing on the sleds too much in our early days, instead of the local technique of slouching on the front, and of being rather soft with our dogs, hadn't run deep. The four of us could be rightly proud that there was competition to buy our animals. To be honest, I don't know what we'd have done if it was privately believed that we had somehow ruined them. Anders, we are almost home. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. And the dogs are running really well now when we're home. It's perfect. Go dogs! From what I've heard from uh, whoever I spoke to about us, uh, they said they were really happy that we actually tried to learn it their way from them. And we could see it when we're going when we sold our dogs and we're going home. They were sold within a couple of days because people really wanted the dogs. They have seen how we have, uh, how well they have performed when we're going out on the tours on the ice, um, and and I think that's one of the biggest compliments you can get that somebody actually wants to buy your dogs. Of course, saying goodbye to our dogs was an enormous wrench because they had become an intrinsic part of our lives. Uh, we had relied on them as much as they had relied on us. 
And as for Dave, I made sure that he went back to Rasmus, who, who bred him in the first place. And I have on good authority that would always look after him in the way that uh, Dave deserves. I'm afraid we didn't really add a great deal to Dave. He ended up still being as, as lazy as we found him, but uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful part of our crew. Come on, Dave. And so, a few dogless days followed before we faced the return series of flights back south. We did get a ride out to another of Michael's fishing spots, this time of course not having to take place in the pitch black. He had been a kind friend to us, always keen to share new skills and even a spare catch if he had a good day's fishing. I think he also enjoyed showing off his English phrases. It looks like a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Yeah. I'll take that as a compliment. You're welcome. <laughs> you cannot use money to uh, buy the bait. Oh, you, you, you give them fish? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think 34 fish we will have on this line. It's only been down like less than three hours, so I'm probably going to be wrong. But we need to let James win something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bed was 25 and um, yeah, we're going to get 25. I ordered it so it will be there. Beautiful. Did you get the bait? It's a beautiful fish. Mm. But uh, it's uh, in Greenland, Thor. Mm -hmm. Does that mean ugly fish? <laughs> <laughs> Our time in the north had been nothing whatsoever like the one we had planned, but we resisted the urge to just return home, back in those dark early days of winter. We had not made total fools of ourselves. We finished with the same number of dogs that we started with, and of all the things we gave away or sold before leaving, it was perhaps right and just that there was no interest whatsoever in our unsightly bright yellow jackets. After all manner of delayed and cancelled flights, we did manage to get our seats on one, going back down the west coast towards Europe again. And as we flew, we all said to each other, no regrets, because we managed to turn something which could have been a complete disaster into probably one of the most formative experiences of our lives. Now, this is the part of the video where I'm going to shamelessly bribe you with more dog footage and uh, videos of us hanging out with our dogs after these concluding comments. Um, and I have absolutely no apologies for that or whatsoever. You've got to stick around towards the end. Those familiar with my videos and social media will be fairly unsurprised as to why this video has appeared now. Firstly, because this platform is now where I've shifted a fair bit of my efforts. And secondly, because I have a new edition released of the book that this video briefly delves into. Due to the turmoil of 2020, all my live events and book signings were cancelled. So you can help me out by getting loads of copies of this new edition online from your local bookshop or sign copies directly from my website. Shameless book selling plug complete. See, that wasn't so hard after all.
Hey. 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 Hey guys. Ricky. What's going on? Guess what you're here again, aren't you? 